Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome back to the As a Woman podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and today I am talking to you about PCOS. I see patients so often who might be struggling with irregular periods. Now, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and PCOS gets a lot of bad press for lack of saying it better. PCOS has been diagnosed with the Rotterdam criteria. And to meet the Rotterdam criteria, you have to have two out of three, which have been irregular or absent periods, clinical or biochemical signs of high androgens, and having a high volume on your ovaries or a high follicle count. Many people don't know that actually this summer, ESHRI, which is the European Society for Reproductive Medicine, released a huge booklet, a workbook, guide to PCOS diagnosis and management. And one huge piece of news is that they did revise the Rotterdam criteria. So they updated them to correlate with modern life, which is really important. Medicine must change as we get new tests or better technology. So when we think about PCOS, we're going to be diving into how are we diagnosing it Before we dive in, a few housekeeping items. One is that I love doing Q&A episodes. I love answering your questions. There are two ways that you can ask questions. One is on Instagram every Monday at Natalie Crawford MD. On Instagram, you can ask your question in the question box. Some will be answered on Instagram. Some will become entire content ideas. Some will be answered in the newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter at nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. And in the newsletter, I am just keeping you updated on life. I have some really exciting things coming. I'm also answering fertility questions there. So that's another great place to get your questions answered. I am updating you on fertility in the news and overall sharing favorite things, my favorite recipes and just things I want you to know. So that's a great place to be. And voicemail episodes, your live questions are my favorite and not so secretly wanting to work my way up to a lot more of them. So 657-229-3672. Again, 657-229-3672. That's the number you can call. Leave a voicemail question. So there's a lot of ways where you can ask your questions and I love answering them. Last two things is on the website. There's a resources tab where you can search all the content that I've made. And if you are really diving in to wanting to take care of your health and learn more about your body or really optimize your fertility, there are the courses on the website, one for those lifestyle interventions and one just to help you understand IVF better. When it comes to PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, about 10% of the female population is going to have this. Now that's probably an underdiagnosed number, so the real number is going to be a little bit higher than this. And when we think about this, a lot of the reason for this underdiagnosis is because either you don't seek medical care, somebody doesn't know this is wrong, or you get put on some form of contraception, maybe for contraception, or maybe for some of these PCOS-like symptoms or PCOS problems, but it masks what is actually going on and you don't receive the actual diagnosis. I've spoken on this before, and I just want to say it again before we dive into this episode. The birth control pill, your IUD, the depo Provera shot, they didn't give you PCOS. Now, They made it so that you couldn't get diagnosed. And maybe you started them because your periods were irregular. Or maybe your dermatologist put you on birth control because of acne. So you might have had the signs, 
but potentially you have been on hormones for so long that it made it hard to get that actual diagnosis. And then when you stopped whatever you were taking and suddenly you had this increase in acne, this increase in irregularity or absentness of your periods, and you started developing some of the other signs and symptoms that go along with PCOS, now you say, oh my gosh, the birth control pill messed me up because before the pill, I didn't have all of this. And all that time on the pill, I was fine, but now I do. And just a gentle reminder, the pill didn't do anything wrong. Not everybody has to be on the pill. Yes, it is overgiven, and people are taking it for a really long time without understanding it. Agree. Potentially, depending on what type of hormones you had, you may have been helping your symptoms. You also may have been making them worse, like... The IUD can make that acne so much worse sometimes. So remember that if you stop something, that's when your period can become a vital sign. Because before that, it's not a vital sign. If you are using any type of hormonal contraceptive, your period is not a reflection of ovulation anymore. And that's okay. I I use the pill for a period of my life. And it's just important to know you don't have that vital sign. So I recommend you stop the pill before you want to get pregnant. Give your body three to six months to try to see how your period is actually going to be. That way you're not behind the game. So these revised Rotterdam criteria, and everywhere it says in adults, because the truth is we also see PCOS overdiagnosed in young people and underdiagnosed in older people. Because it's normal when you are within your first eight years of menarche or starting a period, it's really normal that your period is going to be irregular. If we think about what is happening inside the ovaries before we get into this, remember that in the ovary, you have all your eggs. You're born with all your eggs. They are there. We really think PCOS, its origin story, is likely some epigenetic programming from when your mom was pregnant with you is really the number one thing here. And that's why there's such a genetic tie. Now, there's also probably environmental components. Some of those things might be toxins, might be obesity. But likely, there's these two epigenetic and environmental pieces causing us to really develop PCOS. I've said this a lot of times, and I want to say it again. PCOS, we need to stop taking women's health medical diagnoses and making them so stigmatized. If your ovaries are not working, if your brain and ovary is just not communicating and it is resulting in this syndrome, we've got to release like blame because there is this social media narrative that if you work hard enough or you're healthy enough, you can cure or overcome your PCOS. And that is not true. That's not true because to be true, it's universally applied. What is true is that if you have PCOS, your hormonal balance is extremely sensitive to stressors and to your world and your life. And so learning how to study that and control it, learning how to optimize your PCOS is 100% important. So we will talk about lifestyle. However, it's important to release yourself That if you're not having regular periods by doing natural things, that you're a failure, some people will never achieve that. And we need to understand PCOS is a chronic illness. It is not just this little ovulation problem and it's not just a fertility problem. There are medical complications associated with PCOS, including anxiety, depression, sleeping disorders, eating disorders, acne, hair growth, obviously infertility, endometrial cancer, pregnancy complications, insulin resistance, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, higher risk for cardiac events. These are very real things that impact people with PCOS. And you've got to get into the right diagnostic criteria to even know that this is you. Truly, 
I'm a fertility doctor. I see patients every day and I see patients every single week whose primary question, in addition to trying to get pregnant, but their primary question when I'm making them fill out their goals for the visit, because y'all know me and goals, I'm all about that. Do I have PCOS? Ma'am, how are we 40 and do not know? How are we 30 and do not know? That is not your fault. That is a huge failure of us. All right, so let's walk through some of these diagnostic criteria and changes. And one of the biggest ones is going to be a more stepwise approach of how you diagnose this. Also, the exclusion of people close to menarche and the inclusion of AMH in this diagnostic algorithm. Let's just start with this. Let's remember all your eggs are in that vault. I always say PCOS at its simplest is you are born with a lot of eggs. Why? Oh, such a good question. I think it's something, as we said, when you're a baby inside your mother's womb, because you're supposed to lose half your eggs during that time to then be presented at birth with what would be a normal amount of eggs. And even though having a lot of eggs sounds awesome sauce, it doesn't mean you are going to have prolonged fertility because what happens is that vault, that storage center in the ovary where all your eggs are kept, it releases a group of eggs every single month, no matter what, and it releases more when you have more. So when you have PCOS, and if you're born with all these eggs in your vault, you are then sending out more eggs every single month. So you're catching up, you're going through menopause at that same time. And you're actually might have harder times getting pregnant because of all this PCOS reproductive hormonal impact during your reproductive years. Remember that you're losing eggs every month, even before you start your period. So from the moment you're born, you have these group of eggs that's coming out of the vault. Every egg grows inside a follicle. And before you start puberty, because what is puberty? Puberty is the activation of the brain, meaning now it is going to be sending out FSH. And before it does that, you have a group of eggs, each egg in a follicle coming out of the vault doing nothing. They just die next month, another group. So you have PCOS, you have a high number you don't really know. When the brain activates, it starts by sending out FSH first. FSH is going to start growing an egg and this egg is going to start making estrogen. The brain is not accustomed to seeing estrogen in this high. It doesn't know how to respond. It's not mature enough to send out an LH surge at the appropriate time. And this is very normal and expected. And this is why in female puberty, we have estrogen exposure for about two years before we actually start menstruating because our brain is sending out FSH, eggs are starting to grow, make a little estrogen, but they are not ovulating because the brain is not sending out LH. And this is important because this is when you start developing some of those female secondary sex characteristics like breast development. If you have a young one, breast development starts on average about two years before you have your period. So if you see that your daughter starts having breast budding, she is probably going to have her period within a couple years. And in fact, if she doesn't, by three years, that's actually one of the diagnoses of primary amenorrhea. So if you've had breast development for three years and no period, you should take her to a doctor to go get evaluated for what is going on. Now, some of those cases might actually be PCOS, but what is so hard is that this brain has such a hard time maturing. It takes a while. And so using irregular periods and diagnosing PCOS in people who are within the first eight years from starting your period, we can't use some of the same criteria. So you can have irregular periods, but we know irregular periods are a little bit more common. And we know that people in this age range have a lot of eggs because they're young. Their vault's not depleted yet. So if I use irregular periods and then having a high egg count on ultrasound on a 16-year-old, I might diagnose a ton of people with PCOS who actually just have physiologic irregular periods because of where they are in starting their menstrual cycle and maturity of their hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So it has changed if you're younger. Important tidbit. The other thing that has changed is utilizing AMH. Now, why is this such a big deal? I don't think many people realize 
that 10 years ago, we were just starting to check AMH. It was still novel. It wasn't something that's so common. And if you've been in the fertility world, you have a really good grasp on your AMH. And I am drawing AMH and talking about AMH every day. And we could go on my soapbox about why, if you want to have kids in the future, you should get an AMH checked. Your medical societies say and give suggestions that you shouldn't check an AMH because an AMH is reflective of your egg count and having a low egg count does not mean you can't get pregnant at that moment. And that is true. However, if you have a low egg count, you are going to have less opportunity to conceive in your lifetime. And if you are younger or delaying getting pregnant, you might make a different choice. We also know that with a lower AMH means you have less follicles available. And if you're doing egg freezing or IVF, you're going to have a lower ROI per cycle because you have less eggs available. And the other variable for success is your age. So intervening younger will help you have a higher chance of success. So even though these organizations come in with screening guidelines and every physician who's out here understands, screening guidelines are based on the population and they really live in a jaded world as if our government was paying for our screening because they're trying to say at what point does the cost of doing this test diagnose enough people that it makes sense to do it. It doesn't matter because we don't live in that world here in the U.S. So my thought is if you understand that an AMH test might not reflect your immediate fertility right now, however, might change your behavior, you might freeze your eggs or you might try to get pregnant sooner, then that is a hugely valuable piece of information. And if I could say one thing to every physician out there who's not an REI would be if you are talking to a woman about birth control, your next sentence is, do you want to be pregnant someday? And if the answer is yes, consider drawing an AMH. You are going to say, this is a marker of how your eggs are right now. This is not guaranteeing that you can get pregnant. This does not mean that you'll have a normal egg count in the future. It tells us nothing about the decline of eggs over time, but it tells us about how many you have now. If your AMH test is low, you could still get pregnant. It does not reflect fertility. However, it reflects a shorter reproductive lifespan, and I will send you to a fertility doctor so that they can do further testing and counsel you on options so that you can have a higher chance of having a child if that is a life goal of yours. AMH is made from the granulosa cells. The granulosa cells are the cells that surround every follicle. I like to say that you can imagine you have all those eggs being released from the vault in a given month. You have granulosa cells around all of those follicles. And so AMH is made from them. It is higher when you have more eggs and it is lower when you have fewer eggs. There has been a lot of debate about diagnostic levels, and for a long time, people have said, oh, you can't use it for PCOS. And that leads you to the debate about what is normal and what is not. Truly, normal is going to be based on your age, but let me give you the roughest guidelines. In people who are going to be young, who are under age 35, I really want to see an AMH in the two to four range. If you're now 35, 38, I want to see 1.5 to 3. And if you're 39 and older, I really want to see it over 1. So across the board, if your AMH is less than 1, I am displeased. The younger you are, it might be abnormal to even be 1.2 or 1.4, regardless of what that scale says. But what is going to make AMH on the high end? How is it going to help us with diagnosing PCOS? Because if you have more eggs outside the vault, you're going to have more AMH being made. A few really important caveats about AMH that we have to say. AMH is going to peak in everybody in that 20 to 25 year range. BMI. Your blood AMH is going to be lower when you have a higher BMI. When you have taking hormonal contraception. So if you're taking the birth control pill, for example, your granulosa cells are less active. 
doesn't mean you have less eggs, but they're less active, so they're making less AMH. And if you've had ovarian surgery recently, it might also be a little bit artificially lower because of the same reason those granulosa cells aren't as active because the ovary is healing. We do think there is some variation of AMH based on the menstrual cycle, but not so much that it makes us want to check it on a certain day. Because what we find is that if I force you to come in on cycle day three to get all this done, I am really just delaying getting you to the actual diagnosis. And of course, that is the opposite of what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to get more people, better information, and we are trying to make the diagnostic criteria easier for everybody. So looking at 53 plus studies, they came up with a level of AMH of 8.5 or greater fitting into this diagnostic criteria or two times the normal range or whatever that is on the lab test. And of course, different studies are showing different things. Clinically, as a practitioner, as a doctor who sees AMH all the time, if your AMH is over five, there's a good chance you have PCOS. It's not 100%, but certainly the higher it gets, yeah, the more certain that gets. But realizing that even, you know, AMH levels in the five and above is not really seen in most people. But that doesn't mean if you come in with an AMH of six and you have regular periods, you have no signs of high androgens, you just have a high egg count. So understanding the difference is really important. The diagnostic criteria now. So it's still the Rotterdam criteria, but they're modified. Number one, do you have irregular cycles and clinical high androgens? So what does that mean? Irregular cycles, remember normal, that very first year of puberty. In those first eight years, if we're thinking of that menarche time frame, it's normal to have some irregularity. But if they are more than 45 days apart or less than 21 days apart, that's still going to get you into this diagnosis. If you're really in your regular cycling life, you're not close to menarche or menopause, then we should be seeing cycles between 21 to 35 days, and you should have more than eight cycles per year. I'm also going to say they should be regular. So if your cycle is 21 days one month and 35 the next, that's not regular. And then remember, primary amenorrhea, amenorrhea is the same as irregular periods. It's the extreme. It's the absence of your period. So three years after breast development, no period is primary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea is you've had at least one period, but you haven't had another period, and now it's been six months. Clinical high androgens. Why is this important and what really counts? Let's just remember that in the basis of PCOS, I said, is you have a lot of eggs inside that ovary. The brain is sending out FSH, and I like to describe it as the brain is sending out its normal amount of FSH. It doesn't know you have PCOS, so it sends out its normal amount, but you have more eggs, so that FSH gets diluted. What is now happening is that there's not a strong enough signal to get any one egg to respond at a reliable, predictable timeline. Therefore, you're not making high levels of estrogen. Let's imagine that each little egg makes some estrogen because it does. Eggs come out of the vault, and for the simplicity of the discussion, let's say each egg makes one picogram of estrogen. So if you have 20 eggs, you have 20. If you have 50 eggs, you have 50. But when you're ovulating, when you get that mature follicle about to ovulate, you're making estrogen levels upwards of the 200s. So much more. Oh my gosh, your brain loves that estrogen. Your bones, your heart, your vagina, everything. But when you're not making it, the ovary actually gets really bored because the ovary is not this passive thing. It is a hormone making factory and its favorite hormone to make. It's hormone de jour is estrogen. But if you're not making estrogen because you're not getting that stimulus from the brain to turn on the estrogen factory, what happens? Well, those fecal cells that make testosterone get stimulated by LH and now you get testosterone production. And this testosterone positively feeds back and you get more and more 
It then makes it harder to ovulate. It also leads to these clinical signs of high androgens and the metabolic consequences we see of PCOS. What is also happening at the same time is because the ovaries are all making these little bitty amounts of estrogen, the brain is not being stimulated that it's not really ovulating because it's being told there's a little bit of estrogen. In the example I gave, if the brain is seeing 50 picograms of estrogen, it's thinking, cool, there's an egg growing. I should send out less FSH so we don't have five babies. I only need the one egg. But there's not an egg. You have a lot of small follicles. So now the brain is sending out less FSH, but you already didn't have enough to get an egg to grow. So you get stuck in this pattern of anovulation or irregularity because maybe the next month you don't have 50 eggs, you have 40, and now the estrogen drops a little, so the brain does send out a little bit bigger signal, and now you randomly ovulate, but you don't know when that is, and you're just stuck in this pattern. So the clinical signs of high androgens, to get back to the diagnosis, acne, female facial hair, hirsutism, there's actually a scale you can use for this called the Ferryman Galloway score, and you can look up about where you have hair, and it grades this hirsutism. So if you have acne, if you have hirsutism, facial hair, or hair loss, so think about male pattern baldness, losing some of that hair, that can also be graded with something called the Ludwig score. So you can look these up. In adolescence, to meet this, you have to have severe acne and hair growth. Now, you need to rule out other causes. And what does that mean? What are other causes? There are other things that can, especially if you have severe features or you're young. So I have seen people get the PCOS diagnosis without adequately ruling out other things that do cause irregularity of periods or high androgens. So if we are saying step one is you have both of these and I do nothing else but diagnose you, I have to make sure this is what you have. So this is making sure you don't have thyroid disease, check a TSH, prolactin, check a prolactin level, non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia, there's a blood test called a 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Now, if we're amenorrheic and we have no periods, we also should add on values to see if we have hypo-hypo, meaning is the brain not sending out any signals at all, Cushing's disease, or do you have any androgen-producing tumors, specifically of the ovary with testosterone or the adrenal glands with DHEAS? These things should have more overt, really bad, really extreme hair growth, clitoromegaly, deepening of your voice, baldness, but we really want to make sure, especially the younger person or somebody with severe features, we're giving them the accurate diagnosis. But if we are having irregularity of periods plus clinical androgen signs, and we don't have any of those things, you have PCOS. And I really like this because one thing that has bothered me for a long time is people getting a PCOS diagnosis because they had a high egg count and they were young and they have some acne. Because to me, irregularity of your periods is truly a hallmark of the disease. Okay, if you do not have the high androgen, so let's just say you just have the irregular cycles, now we can check for biochemical signs of high androgens. We still should exclude the other causes, but this is because there's a lot of good treatments for acne, there's treatments for hair, and so those may not be reliable markers in a lot of people nowadays. When we are using biochemical levels, somebody should be drawing testosterone, ideally a total and a free testosterone. That's typically the real androgen that's gonna be high. But you can also see androstenedione or DHEAS can be measured, but those are much more limited with PCOS. Just like other reproductive hormones, FSH, LH, estradiol, testosterone is not accurate and should not be drawn while you are on birth control pills. Hormonal contraception changes these labs. That's how you don't ovulate. That's why you don't have acne. But let's not 
draw them when you're on the pill and then exclude something that doesn't make any sense. Now, if I only have irregular cycles or high androgens, this is when we can do an ultrasound or an AMH. And it says or. So if we have excluded the other causes, I have irregular cycles and a high AMH, hello, PCOS. If you are an adolescent, ultrasound or AMH is not going to be accurate. It's not recommended. So an adolescent with irregular cycles alone, an adolescent with regular cycles but high androgens, we should rule out other causes and we should tell them about PCOS, that they are at risk for it. But we don't label them with this diagnosis because of the maturity of the HPO axis at that time. And then just side notes, if we're using ultrasound, we now should see 20 follicles per ovary. That's higher than it used to be. Or we have that AMH level 8.5 or higher or two times the normal threshold. And again, a lot of different studies are saying different things. I personally think they'll lower that. But with the culminative picture, that's where we are right now. All right, so you have PCOS. Now what? What does that mean? And I realize this episode is getting long, so I'm going to dive into a lot of the fertility aspects in the next episode, I guess. But the things to think about. So one of the biggest ones and one of the things that all of your fertility doctors or OBGYNs are going to be so worried about, and this is what really led to the easy prescribing of progesterone and birth control pills is that people with PCOS have a two to six fold increase of endometrial cancer. And that number is scary. Although the absolute risk is still low. What this means is that if you have PCOS and you are not having regular cycles, prolonged amenorrhea, weird funky bleeding, you've gained weight, you have a thick lining on ultrasound, you need to get an endometrial biopsy. How we prevent this from happening is making you bleed. What I tell patients is that we can imagine that all of those small follicles making a tiny amount of estrogen, so we'll go back to that 50 example, that is stimulating the endometrium to grow. But it's never getting that signal to shed or to bleed or to menstruate until after you ovulate. So you are stuck in this process where you have constant stimulation of the lining. This may lead to breakthrough bleeding, and those cells are not meant to just sit in that uterus, and that is where endometrial hyperplasia and cancer can develop. If you are not having periods every three months or closer together, you need to bleed. So this can be a continuous oral contraceptive pill, a daily estrogen progesterone pill affectionately known as the birth control pill. It doesn't have to be. And if you're trying to get pregnant or you do not like the birth control pill, you at a minimum need progestin therapy. Now, this can be done daily. IUD, that's what the shot is. You can take daily pills like the mini pill. That's fine. That's contraception. If you potentially want to get pregnant, you should not be taking daily progesterone. And I see this all the time and it drives me bonkers. You should be on cyclic progesterone because you might randomly ovulate or you might be doing fertility treatment at some point in the future. But at a minimum, if you have PCOS, you need to bleed every three months unless you're on a preventative contraceptive. So this could be you take progestin every three months, seven to 10 days, have a period and carry on with your life. So you need to do something. We do not want you to develop a cancer that we could have prevented. Your weight also becomes an important piece of this. And I think it's very important to say your body weight can vary extreme on PCOS. I see people who are underweight and people who are overweight. So it is not a disease just one way. But what is pretty common with the disease is once the ovary gets into that testosterone making zone, you're going to change your risk profile out of normal female into more of a male pattern. What this means is that you now have a higher risk of cardiac events. You are also going to have a higher risk of high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, and that testosterone, that insulin resistance is causing you to keep fat 
centrally, abdominally increasing your waist circumference. If we think about very stereotypical body size and habitus, we see that woman body size with a thinner waist and then a bigger hips and butts, very Kardashian-esque, and the male beer belly being more of a male body shape. So testosterone is pushing you over, and you might even be very thin. My thin PCOS patients will often say they feel like they have this pot belly or that they can't lose that abdominal weight. So weight gain is definitely a part of this process, and achieving weight loss is really tough because you're trying to reverse part of this ovarian mechanism. This is why there are some lifestyle interventions and we've got to think about what we can do to make ourselves healthier. But obviously weight is a multifaceted option. And I will say that there shouldn't be no stigma with it and people need better weight loss support. And I am happy to see Ozempic and other weight loss medications utilizing the PCOS population with such encouraging results. You should stop them two months before you want to get pregnant. But I do love seeing the conversation open up about weight management instead of something that everybody just avoids. There's a whole other side to this, which is lifestyle management for non-fertility, for fertility, and then the latest studies looking at your chance of ovulating based on your AMH, which I think is really important conversation to have in the decision making. When it comes to PCOS itself, I hope more people view this as a less of a stigma. There has been such an association with weight. And even for all the reasons I just said, how downstream PCOS impacts your weight, weight also impacts your PCOS because your fat cells make estrogen. And in that estrogen, tells the brain it confuses it and the brain says oh we do have an egg growing and sends out even less fsh and that is why if you are overweight and you go and you lose weight you might see an improvement in your ovulatory status so normalizing weight can be an important variable for somebody who is overweight and trying to get pregnant or even just ovulate on their own or decrease their risk of metabolic or endometrial cancer. So we need to be having the weight discussion and supporting our patients with PCOS, understanding that the disease itself contributes, but then once you gain weight, it amplifies everything because now it's so much harder for the brain to actually send out a strong enough signal to get you to ovulate. All right, so the take-home message here is that The diagnostic algorithm really has changed. Irregular menses, absent periods, irregular periods are the hallmark of the disease. Understand that if you have irregular periods and you have acne, you have just diagnosed yourself. You have PCOS. You do, okay? Now, I guess we should rule out those other causes. So let's schedule an appointment with your doctor. Let's make sure it really is because you meet the diagnostic criteria as long as that little star says exclude other causes. So you need to go in and make sure there isn't something else contributing. If you have PCOS, it does not mean you have infertility. It does not mean you can't get pregnant. It does not mean you'll get cancer or have any of these things, but understanding your increased risk for a variety of things will allow you to manage your life better, optimize your fertility, plan for it, and ultimately be your healthiest self. All right, friends, this episode has gone long. So next week we'll do PCOS, lifestyle interventions and medical interventions for those trying and not trying to conceive, including talking about the AMH study. And I will do some PCOS Q&A specifics. So hopefully this is just helping you understand the disease better because at the end of the day, you deserve to understand your body. I just wanna say a huge thanks. Love you guys so much. Remember, you can call and leave your questions on the voicemail at 657-229-3672. I'm also working on something really exciting, and I would love to show people that you like my content. So you are going to be seeing a few places where I would love it if you would leave a review on this podcast, or if you would leave a comment on the Instagram comment box we're going to leave, or if you want to send an email, hello at nataliecrawfordmd.com, telling me that this content matters to you 
so that I can show other people that we should make more of it. Thanks, friends. Thank you all for listening to As a Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman.